And greetings. Happy Thursday, if that's the day that it is as you are watching me today. Quick update. Um, homework two and quiz two for today. Hope you all had a good Valentine's Day on Tuesday. And, uh, and that was when the homework was postponed from. So hopefully that made it even better. Um, these are <clears throat> up and should be available throughout the day for submitting the homework and uh, taking the quiz, all right? <clears throat> Speaking of which, the first ones were graded and should be in the gradebook, so uh, something should pop up for you with respect to these. Um, I want to make sure if you are watching this and have not turned in homework one or quiz one, please be sure to get homework two and quiz two started. Um, it helps to kind of establish a routine here, and these are going to be useful for not only grade enhancements, but also to help study for the first midterm, which is maybe two week, two weeks, three weeks. I actually forget. I'll check on that. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so that's the situation with the stuff. Also, on Tuesday next week, uh, we will be having um, we are having a four day weekend this weekend. So uh, Cabrillo Friday and Monday, uh, we are off school, which doesn't affect us. <clears throat> However, on the Tuesday following that, um, I will have to uh, post a, um, I will not be here for the live class, but I will post the asynchronous lecture for that day. All right. So um, it won't be done this way. Um, but the recording will be made available um, as usual in one of the uh, modules. So I will probably do one of those ahead of time and uh, put it in there. <clears throat> so there won't be an actual live class as usual. It will just be uh, asynchronous, but that's only for Tuesday. And uh, Thursday, we'll be back to it uh, one week from today. All right, now we're gonna start a new, uh, a new topic today, energy and power. And that homework, I think I'll probably be uh, thinking about next Thursday for the due date. So that's tentative right now as I already pushed back homework to one day. I may also do the same thing with this one. So we'll see where that takes us. <clears throat> um, and that would be, today is the 16th, so that would be the 23rd. Um, so I'll get that enabled. It's not up or on the Canvas site yet, but it will be by the end of the day today. And I'm thinking about that day. Um, as possible. So we'll see what we can get done this class and uh, what we can get done on the recording on Tuesday and we'll go from there. If I'm if I'm feeling at the end of class on Tuesday, which uh, not live, but if I'm feeling like I'm not quite finished up, then I'll make an announcement at the end of that video as to when this will be and I'll update that due date in the canvas uh, in the canvas. Um, okay, so, that is where things are for us at this point. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and uh, get started with energy and power today. <clears throat> uh, let's see, yeah, if you, yeah, please do remember to do homework two and quiz two today and uh, get those submitted. The recordings are all up and available. Um, I realized this morning 
that one of the modules was not published. Sorry, I did publish it for the class last time. So that's up and running now. Uh, I did not realize because the page individually was published, but the module wasn't. So it didn't put it out there for you, but it is there now. So last class uh, on Tuesday, it should be there. And the week three stuff should be uh, started at least. All right. So there's that. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and start some energy and power, uh, unless you have any questions in the meantime. Hmm, I gotta see how I feel about this. Well, that makes things a lot clearer. Hmm, I can see you better with these on. All right, we'll do this. It's still kind of making me a little bit, uh, I'm getting, well, you know, I wore glasses for years and years and years. And then when COVID came and, and I don't have anybody to look at except, you know, my computer screens sitting in front of me. So I quit wearing glasses. And then I sat on them a couple of times or something. I don't know. Anyway, they got pretty maunched. So this is my first time back wearing glasses regularly and still is making me a little queasy to get my vision adjusted. My eyes are still kind of, they don't know what to do. Like, shouldn't we be squinting or something to be able to see stuff? No. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about energy and power. <clears throat> uh, energy... I'm going to give you the uh, technical definition of energy here. Um, for energy, <clears throat> it's, the, uh, it's the ability to do damage. Um, I really like that as uh, a definition. And, and okay, so sure, maybe it's not the most technical set of words, but it really captures the spirit of energy in a pretty good way. Um, sorry, I just got to refill the pen here. Okay. Um, I, because things that have energy can transfer that energy to other objects. And when you transfer energy to other objects, there's a, uh, you know, a lot, there's a, there's a, there's a law that we have about how energy transfers and things like that. And typically energy left to its own devices will become randomized <clears throat> and disorganized. And, and the biggest way for it to do that is to become essentially, um, I, I want to say heat, but it gets transferred away as heat. So it goes into making the surrounding air, perhaps, a little bit higher in temperature. Every time I'm talking, I'm, exp I'm, I'm using energy out my vocal cords, and I'm making air molecules bounce around, but ultimately they eventually get randomized. And the sound in this room bounces off the walls a few times and then disperses. And I don't hear my voice. I don't hear an echo for more than about a quarter of a second. So the walls heat up a little bit, the air heats up a little bit, and my, my organized energy of speech is now disorganized, slightly warmer air. <clears throat> and so uh, it's the ability to do damage or kind of heat stuff up, if you like. Okay, so things that crash into other things can impart um, energy to them and cause them to crumple or smash or do something like that. And that's how you can check to see, hey, that, that thing had energy in it because it just hit that thing and now this thing's all crushed up, right? It takes, it takes a force and it takes some pushing to crumple something up or to, to 
to have something become damaged or disorganized from what it was. And so damage and heat are both more disorganized versions of things. And that's how you know energy was involved. <clears throat> All right. So uh, energy is basically the ability to do damage. And power is essentially uh, the rate at which the energy can get transferred. So as the so so say, for example, um, I'm going to I'm going to think of, oh, gosh, I forgot my hammer. Oh, well, um, we're gonna have to pretend I have a hammer in my hand here. <clears throat> okay, so I have a hammer and a nail. Okay. Uh, right, let's try this. <sighs> okay. I have a hammer and a stapler, which I'm <laughs> a, a stapler, which I'm pretending is a hammer and a pen, which I'm pretending is a nail. Okay. See, we're all, this is how you become a theoretical physicist. All right. Take it from one who knows. You just pretend stuff is other stuff, and then you just say, hey, what happens if this happens? All right, so I'm going to take the nail, I'm going to hit it with the hammer, okay? So in terms of what is power, right, that uh, the, the, you know that I had energy involved in the hammer because when I hit that, okay, I can hear it. Eventually, that sound has become something that is heated up air. I have heated up the nail, and the if I'm maybe putting it into a block of wood. I'm heating the wood up as I'm driving this nail in, okay? Um, and you can actually feel that. If you bang on something a number of times, if it's a metal object and then you touch it, you will feel it warmer. So that's the ability of energy to heat stuff up and do damage. You are damaging the wood that you are pushing the nail through. You're making a hole in it, <clears throat> okay? So the hammer has energy, as it hits the nail, the nail gets the energy, some of the energy from the hammer transferred to it. So the energy goes into the nail a little bit and the nail goes and damages, okay? And heck, you could damage the nail too, just by whacking it this way, you'd, you'd make the nail, nail head go all wonky. Okay, so that's the energy that's involved. What about the power? The power is the rate at which energy is transferred. So think about the energy that the hammer has. Right now, it doesn't really have any. I'm going to use my muscles to do this, but think about the amount of time that I just spent transferring energy into the hammer versus how quickly it gets transferred away from the hammer, hits the nail, okay? Those times are very different, which means my transfer was very low, and then this transfer was very high power. Okay. This is, we'll talk more about that. So don't worry about if this makes sense right away. We will be spending time. I'm just giving you right now the difference. One is an, one is a quantity. The energy is a quantity and the power is the rate at which that quantity gets transferred. All right. So in some sense, um, you can think of it as, uh, for example, distance and speed. Distance is a certain quantity, and speed is the rate at which you go through that quantity, right? It's how quickly did you do that? If you went, right, you had a high speed because you took very little time, but if you're like I was this morning trying to get my kids to school, I always, I always calculate the average speed with them. You know, I took, when I, the cars are so crazy these days, like you, they give you the Here's the mileage you just traveled, and here's how long it took. They won't tell you the average speed. Well, maybe they will, but it's an easy, quick calculation. I said, well, it took, we did, you know, 12 miles, and it took 45 minutes. So how many miles, what was our average miles per hour? And so we have to think about that for a little while. Good little exercise. Um, so power is the rate at which energy is transferred. All right. Okay. And the rate meaning it's based on time. Okay. The rate uh, 
how much time did it take for that energy to get transferred? And um, the same is true. Whenever you talk about a rate, the same is true for um, things like distance and speed. If I went, if I went at a high average speed through this distance, then it took very little time. So small time, large rate. Same idea here. Small time for energy transfer, right? Then big power, because that's the big rate of transfer, right? Okay, so anyway, there's a little bit on that. That's the difference between the two. Sometimes in, you know, you're reading a newspaper, you're reading an article, and then they, they mix these two up, and they say, oh, energy power, and they, and they kind of... Um, and they kind of just use one in place of the other. So it, for us, it's different. And I just want to let you know that. Um, and there's times where you'll find this type of thing, like the words heat and temperature. They mean different things to physicists. They're different things. But sometimes in the newspaper articles or the, the popular press, you would see them mixed up. Um, used interchangeably. That's what I was trying to say. <clears throat> All right. Um, so I have a couple of demonstrations I wanted to show you here, and then a uh, and then a quick video. <clears throat> um, all right, so let's see here. I'm going to uh, try and angle you down a little bit so we can see how we want to do that. I'm going to go like this. My very technical setup, and okay, so now you can see my track. Got a bunch of ping pong balls here. This is going to be. My kids have this thing where they say it's very satisfying to do something like take, uh, like peel off scotch tape all in one go off something or, or just like, oh, it's very satisfying. Well, here's my very satisfying moment for the day. Okay. I have my, uh, never mind about the cylinder on top of the cart. That doesn't matter. Just gives it a little bit extra mass. Okay. I'm going to test and see how do we, how do we know how energy is carried in things, okay? How do we know, how is energy stored? So this is, um, this is gonna be like one of those abstract concepts. We haven't really reached abstract concepts yet until now. Ah, boy, I tell you, it gets, it gets uh, low temperature and, uh, you get all thirsty all the time. Your lips get all chapped. There's not much moisture in the air. Gee, why is that? Ah, physics, great. Back to this. Energy is an abstract thing. So prior to now, we've been talking about things like speeds and accelerations. <clears throat> and yes, the acceleration seemed a little weird because uh, you could accelerate when, you're out, when your speed is zero or your velocity is zero. You can accelerate. Um, otherwise, you could never move. So maybe the definitions of them got a little weird, but they're they're not abstract concepts. They're concrete ideas. You have an idea of what acceleration is. If I tell you speeding up, slowing down, turning, you have an idea of what those mean. Forces. I'm going to push on something and it's going to cause it to change its motion by speeding up, slowing down, or turning. Um, and you're going to say, okay, a force, I kind of, I kind of know what one of those are. But energy, what is that? How do you measure that? How do you know something has it? Well, that's why I gave you this, which you can't quite see now, but the, the ability to do damage. <clears throat> okay. Then you know that something has carried energy with it. And here's an example of one right now. Very satisfying. There was energy carried by the cart because it just destroyed all of the nice little configuration of ping pong balls I had here. And that means that there is energy carried by the motion of objects, right? So there's one place we can look to find out where energy is. How do we, how do we know something has energy? Well, it just busted all these things apart. Okay, well, that thing had energy then, okay? Now, I could do the same thing if I had elevated the, right, right? What if I had put the ping pong balls, and I could do it this way, like this. Okay, I could say, here's my ping pong ball collection. I'm gonna arrange it very nicely. I'm gonna put some effort into 
uh, into making the ping pong balls nicely arranged like that. And then I'm gonna take this thing and I'm gonna tip it a little bit so that this thing starts kind of high, right? Crunch, bash, bash. Right? So, so there was energy there too because the cart hit the ping pong balls. They went scattering again, again, very satisfying. And the cart had motion. How did it get the motion? Well, in the first case, I pushed it. But in the second case, all I did was start it on a ramp. So that means that there was energy there. And that energy got transferred out of however high up it was into moving the cart, which then destroyed something. So I'm going to take that motion of destroying stuff. Ah, energy's in the motion. Where that energy come from? It came from the height of the cart. So things that are higher also have energy or more energy than other things, all right? And there's an interesting thread here that we're gonna start investigating, um, which is how, uh, how the amounts of energy go in different, into different um, types of energy. How does the energy get divided up and do stuff like that? So we'll talk about that, <clears throat> okay, now, I gotta clean up the ping pong balls here. Uh, and, and I wanna take you over here. All right, let's see here if I can just move you over there. And all I gotta do is swing you around. Oops, gotta back up a little bit here. Um, I want to do this, so I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to do that. Take this here. All right, now uh, let's see if I can make this happen. All right, let me just. All righty, now we're rolling. Okay, <laughs> literally, you are you are rolling. I have you on a cart. <clears throat> All right, sheesh. So how does this look here? Um, that looks, that looks okay. That looks okay. Let's try it about there. I'm gonna go for about there. Hopefully you can see most of what I'm about to do. All right, let's see here. Well, what I have here is a, bowling ball and um it's just connected by a, a thin cable up to the ceiling here um and this is one reason why i wanted to do this class in the classroom because i don't have one of these in my house which is a it's a real bummer i should probably fix that huh i should probably fix that the bowling ball pendulum they're great fun let's go have some fun with the bowling ball pendulum all right i'm going to demonstrate something here now for you, which we haven't yet talked about. <clears throat> However, we're going to find something out here. And I do want you to think about the, the transfer of energy from something that's high up. Then watch what happens because this bowling ball pendulum is going to, I'm going to start it high up and it's going to swing down, be lower, and it's going to be moving faster. And then it's going to move back up and you'll watch it move up but then have most of its energy that way. So it has to have slowed down, right? So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna try and demonstrate the idea that um, more or less energy doesn't just appear or disappear, okay? It's there and we just have to see where it is, okay? So let's see here, I think I can do this. Maybe I can, maybe I can't. I don't, I don't think I can just yet. I need to turn you a little more. I need to turn you a little more that way. All right, so that means you're probably gonna miss a little bit of the bowling ball swinging over that way, but at least this way, I think. Well, I think I gotta turn you a little more. Turn you a little more. Okay, so we're gonna go there. Now let's see here. All right, so now what I'm gonna do <clears throat> is I'm gonna hold this bowling ball right here up near my chin, okay? So I'm gonna go to right there, right up under my chin. 
I'm going to let the thing go. Right? So now, and hopefully it doesn't hit anything, but now take a look at what happens. Okay. I'm just going to have my hands on the, on the backside of the bowling ball here. And now you're not going to be able to see it swinging, but you'll see it coming back into the picture. Here we go. Ready? And go. I love physics. I let the bowling ball go here. And you're watching it speed up as it drops. And whoop, come back up and hit and, and, and try to hit me, but can't. It can't do it. Because there's a thing about energy in which the amount of energy stays the same and doesn't suddenly just increase or decrease for no reason, okay? So it's just like an object which is traveling in motion. It doesn't just suddenly speed up for no reason. You know, a force had to have been applied, right? So same with energy here. I know that the bowling ball has a certain amount of energy at this height, and it can't have more unless for some reason something adds it. But nothing is gonna push on it, nothing's gonna add it, I'm watching myself in the screen. It's like, wow, that thing's coming pretty fast, but it does stop because I believe in physics. And it can't have more energy than I started it with because there's nothing that's actively adding energy to the bowling ball. Okay, now I've dropped it a number of times just by letting my finger, just by letting my hands go like this. Okay, but now. I'm, and, and I'm relying on the energy that the ball had to start with, but now I'm going to go like this. And now, <laughs> and that, now it hit the desk over there. So now I'm going to try it again. Well, let's see how we do. All right, now I'm going to try it again. And we're going to go like this. There we go. That's a better push. But now I'm getting out of the way because I know that the energy the ball had to start with was more than just the height of it. In that case, I pushed it and gave it some initial motion, and that initial motion is then going to stay as energy in the system, but it's going to transfer between motion and height, which means the motion, by the time it gets here, it's going this way still. That's why I'm getting out of the way, because it's going to go just that little bit higher, and then I'm going to lose my teeth. So thank goodness that energy doesn't just suddenly spontaneously increase or decrease. There are reasons why you can change the energy of a system, okay? Like for example, the bowling ball sitting, you can't quite see it, but it's right down there. And it's at a certain height. And now it's at a greater height. Well, yeah, because I just did that. I put energy into the bowling ball by doing that. If I leave it here, it won't do that. Likewise, when I, when I push the ball, I put energy into the system. And so when it comes back, it's going to return that energy to me. Hopefully I duck out of the way, which is what I did. And when I just hold it here and let it go, nothing is then adding or subtracting. Well, a little bit of subtraction because the air is, is in the way and has to plow through air. But otherwise, nothing is adding energy to the system. Okay, So if I let it go here, I know it can't come back any higher. If I just, if I just let go... I, it can't come back any higher than here. And that, friends, we have made into a law. So let's talk about the law of energy. I'm going to uh, roll you back around here. If you have questions, let me know, because now is a great time. I'm just going to be rolling you around. <clears throat> and... Taking you back so we can see the whiteboard. So if there are any questions about anything, let me know. Okay. All right. So I'll take you there. About there.
Okay, it seems like about where you were. Well, you're a little closer, I think. Let's try that. All righty. So this idea of energy is called the law of conservation of energy. And once again, it's a situation where physicists have taken a word, in this case, conservation, and given it a very precise meaning. That's not to say we've not given energy a precise meaning, we have. And it's used in a way for us that we know what we're, uh, as physicists, we know what we're talking about. Um, and ultimately it's such a huge concept that, um, you know, we have secretaries of state for this type of thing. There are people employed in the federal government to figure out what our energy policies are. So this is a big, this is a big concept. Ultimately you vote on this. That's how big energy is. You don't vote on forces, you vote on energy. <clears throat> right, every time we have uh, rolling blackouts or brownouts, it's because there's a power problem, right? Not an energy problem, it's a power problem. Um, all right, so energy can be transferred from one object to another, as I showed you with the cart and the ping pong balls, and between types, even in the same physical object as I showed you with the bowling ball. The bowling ball was high up, swung down, was speeding up, lost some of its kind of height energy, became motion energy, swung back up, became height energy again, came back down, became motion energy again, came back up, become height energy again. So even within one object, the energy can become different, I'll say types, but energy is really energy, right? It's like water, you pour it into different containers, but it's still water, right? So the same thing is essentially happening with energy. It's not really a different kind of energy. It's just that it's being stored in a different way. All right, um, I wanna show you, if I can, I wanna show you this here, boom, boom, and boom. All right, so this is off our Canvas page for this week. All righty. Uh, and I would like to show you this video here, which is just fantastic. Love this one. Um, let's go full screen on that. And gosh, I don't know. I feel like I'm in the way here. I don't, don't want to be there all the time. Uh, maybe over there. All right, let's see how this looks. And we will go here. <laughs> Bro, you see that? What? Oops. Did you see that? Oh, no way! Yeah, guess who this is a commercial for? Shocking. Let's watch this again. We're going to watch this probably several times. And uh, let's look at it from the, from the idea of uh, energy. Okay. So. Okay. So here's our truck. And there's a, a camera, filmer, and a buddy. Bro, you see that? All right. What is it that they're pointing at? Bro, you see that? What? Okay, there we go. I think that's about the earliest I can pause it. There's something streaking towards them. So this thing is coming at a fairly high speed, and it's a meteor. Is this realistic? That's the first question. And we'll get into a little bit of how to tell and, and, uh, and how we can answer that question. But that's the first thing that pops into my mind, which is why I, I uh, enjoyed this commercial. Is that a realistic thing? Right away, I start thinking about stuff like this. I watch a commercial like this. Wow, is that really a, is that really what a meteor looks like? Let's see if we can find out. Hey, do you see that? So this thing's moving, okay? And probably of no surprise, certainly you've watched this already once, 
but you know what then happens. Okay. There's a big explosion because it hits Earth, hits the ground, right? You can see the trail. You can't see what I'm pointing at. You see the trail of smoke right there. I'm not sure where. Oh, there's a trail of smoke right there. That's where I am on my screen. And then it becomes this big fire. Why does it become fire? Why is there a big explosion? Was the meteor made of dynamite? Because I know that dynamite explodes. So how did the meteor explode? Is that something that we would expect to happen? What, what, what's going on here? Meteor, is it moving? Like, is that normal? Like it was over there and now it's here and, and now it's exploding. And certainly I think you would agree, however, that with the explosion, should one be happening in realist, in a realistic sense, should an explosion happen, you would feel a pressure wave, right? Which subsequently knocks the person over, right? And you're thinking now energy, right? You're thinking that this meteor had energy because it was moving. And now the energy has become maybe released somehow and it's heating up its surroundings and it's making a pressure wave in the air. It's pushing out with, uh, with the air. It's pushing out and knocks this person over and, and the friend. Come on, play. Whoa. All right, whoa. Dust in the lungs, people are coughing. Big cloud. Unfortunately, the truck is okay. Oh, no way! Okay. Apparently, it was a meteor. It says meteor proof. Okay, all right. We're going to go watch this again. We're going to go back to here. All right. Uh, I'm going to direct your attention to the truck at this point. Notice there are motorcycles in the back of it. I'm not sure if you noticed that the first time. But that's why this commercial is so good. It's layered. There's a lot to it. Watch the motorcycle. Hey, bro, you see that? What? see now but the bed is empty you see that the bed is empty right there okay wait for it Yay! there they are there's the motorcycles man you gotta love that they thought of a lot of stuff here that's pretty cool you have to admit that was a good one <laughs> all right so there's your meteor proof toyota truck commercial if nothing else they got a lot of money to spend on making good commercials what can i tell you all right. Uh, any comments that you want to throw in here <laughs> with that one? I just love that. Man, that's good. <clears throat> All right, we're going to take a look at this meteor. So if we think about it in terms of the energy, then we have initially lots of motion energy. And for lack of a better word, I'm just going to call it that for now. Um, initially, I should say initially, motion energy initially. Right, because we see it moving. Now, also, it's kind of high up. So there's some height energy in there too. There is some initial height energy. Now, those two things then uh, get transferred. Okay, the meteor comes in. It, it descends from the bowling ball example. You know that when something drops its height, it usually picks up speed if it's left to its own devices. Certainly here I have a ping pong ball. If I just, if I just go like this with the ping pong ball, oh, you see it didn't pick up speed. 
well, that's not really the same thing, is it? Because I'm I'm actively preventing this from happening. So if I just drop it, you'll notice that as it drops, it picks up speed. So when something's high and it's dropping in free fall, like we've talked about, then there is an increase in the motion energy because there's a decrease in the height energy, right? So as it drops, it picks up speed. And that's what is happening here. The uh, speed is increasing. It hits the ground, okay? As it impacts the ground, that energy that it's picked up now is getting transferred into the ground. Or if you like to think of it, earth, it gets transferred into earth. Now, the size of the meteor, I mean, you couldn't really tell how big it was. It was, I mean, it seemed to be making a smoke pattern that was, I don't, I mean, just estimating. It was probably maybe a meter across, something like that. Maybe a meter is about a yard, so maybe a couple of feet. The meteor that's making that is probably smaller than that. So maybe, maybe it's about this size or so. It's, you know, like bowling ball size, wherever my bowling ball went, it's over there. Hey, a little less than bowling ball size, okay? Um, so it comes down and it hits. So when it does that, it heats, right? It heats way up and transfers a lot of that energy to the ground and itself. But there's when you find out there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of heat contained in a small air volume, it tends to expand rapidly, okay? And that hence is what we call an explosion um, or really a conflagration when it's really random like that, okay? We even have words for different types of explosions. How about that, huh? So the energy gets transferred to the ground. It's in a small volume and it therefore expands rapidly because it's extremely hot, okay? So there's a lot of high temperatures in a small place and it's all contained in this small area, volume, I should say. And all of a sudden it's expanding rapidly and that creates a pressure, okay? That creates a pressure push, right? It's high, high temperature, high pressure in the small area. It creates this uh, push out. So the explosion is really getting at something very interesting, which is even though I have a big object, which is moving, it can transfer that energy into the atoms and molecules that make up something and make them vibrate quicker because ultimately that's what temperature is. It's the, it's the idea that the things that are making something up like the atoms that are, that are, in, that are, that are making up the material of us and, and everything, they vibrate quicker because you've transferred energy to them and we call that a higher temperature. Pretty amazing. You think about energy and all of a sudden we're talking about atoms. Oh, how can you not like that? Okay. So the explosion is realistic. That size explosion, I mean, that that seemed like uh that seemed like a couple of um maybe a couple of pounds, maybe a couple hundred pounds of dynamite. Something maybe some would we do something like that. I, I'm I'm making an estimate here, but the explosion was fairly contained. It wasn't huge, but it probably could have taken down, for example, a building that was in that vicinity and toppled it over. So I'm thinking maybe a couple hundred pounds of dynamite would do something like that. <clears throat> All right. Um, so the explosion is realistic. What about the speed of the meteor? Well, I don't remember if you, uh, I don't know if you've watched last class, but if you remember from last class, Earth is moving somewhere around 20 to 30,000 miles an hour around the sun, it's something around like 10 to 20,000 miles an hour. So 
when we hit something at that speed, it looks to us like that thing's coming in at 10 or 20,000 miles an hour, which is pretty fast, by the way, um, because we don't have a sensation of us moving, right? We have a sensation of everything else moving with respect to us. And therefore, if there are still rocks that are just hanging out in our way, specks of dust, grains of sand, small, tiny rocks, shards, something like that. If we hit them at 10,000 miles an hour, there's going to be some energy trend, right? It's going to look like they're coming at us at 10,000 miles an hour. That's fast, okay? And that means they have a lot of energy. And that looks basically like what you saw in the video. It's over there. And then all of a sudden it's down here because it's moving 10,000 miles an hour. Yeah, it's that quick. So that video is actually really good. Hey, what's that? Right? It is that quick. Um, every time you see a meteor shower, it's because we are running into small shards of things like uh, bits of comet leftovers or bits of something that has been coming apart because it's been in it's been bombarded by the sunlight. Sunlight outside of the atmosphere is really bad for things. It breaks things up. The sun's kind of a, a death ball. But fortunately, we have an atmosphere that cushions all of the bad stuff. So we manage. You know? But you live somewhere like Mercury or the moon, no atmosphere. Uh, it's bad. It's bad. So stuff gets in our way and we go plowing through it at 10, 20,000 miles an hour. And so that creates these meteor showers, right? And a meteor shower might just be something as small as a marble or a grain of sand, and it makes across the sky. That's all it takes. Uh, uh, believe me, you don't want to be in the way of a grain of sand moving 10,000 miles an hour. It will go right through you, okay? So it makes a nice track in the sky. We go, ooh, and then move on because thank goodness for air, it burst into flames trying to get through the air in order to try and kill us, basically, right? Um, every day, you thank your atmosphere. Thank your local friendly atmosphere for protecting you from all of this stuff. All right. So here we got this. Um, in terms of the power that was going on in that, the power was the energy transfer. How quickly did it happen, right? Happening, 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 happening. Lowish power because the time is long, right? Sudden big explosion, extremely high power, right? Time very short. As the thing hits Earth, boom, right? That's a high power situation. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I got... Uh, I got one other thing I want to show you. Um, but I need to find where I've put it. Hmm. Well, gee whiz. Huh. All right. Well, I'm not seeing it right now. All right. Well, I'll show you that one next time after I track it down. Um, what I want to get into now is um, our law of energy. Okay, So we kind of described what has happened with the meteor. And I want to tell you what is the overriding uh, principle that we use when trying to make analysis uh, of an energy transfer. All right, we have this thing called the law of energy conservation or conservation of energy, whichever you like. Um, and you say, well, wait, uh, we know what that is already, right? Because we have these stickers underneath the, the um, light switches and it says, turn off when not in use, conserve energy. 
likewise with other things, heaters, other light bulbs, um, you know, things you don't want to leave running. You know, when you leave a, a hotel or something, they say, turn the, turn the climate control off, turn the AC off, right? Don't leave it running while you're not in the room. Okay, conserve energy. Well, that is not quite what this means. Again, what gives us the right to do this? Nothing, but we needed a way to communicate, so we chose the word conservation. And this has a particular meaning for us in physics. <clears throat> and there are a couple of laws around the idea of conservation. What does this mean? The meaning of conservation is basically that the amount does not change. In other words, if I have a situation over here for some reason, and I think about how much energy there is in here, okay, I don't know, I just think up a, just, you know, well, a way to do that. I mean, I don't know if there's a way to do this. I mean, somehow measure or calculate how much energy there is in this situation, right? Like say the meteor uh, at, uh, up in the atmosphere as it's, burning in here towards us, right? I, I measure the energy and it's, I don't know, 100. It has 100 units of energy, whatever that is. Okay? Well, that means later on, after the collision with Earth, <clears throat> I could pick any time. I could pick, uh, you know, the meteor was here. Well, now it's here. Does it still have 100 energy? Yep. It just doesn't look the same because now it's a little bit less high. Ah, but it's going faster. Okay, and now what about down here? Well, by this time, it's also burned a little bit through the air. The air is combusted. So even though it's dropped in height and it's lost that part of its energy storage, it got faster, but then it took some of that fastness and put it into making this big smoke trail and burning some of itself off and heating up the air. Oh, so if I include all that, yep, there it is, 100 energies. 100, 100 amounts of energy. Okay, it hits Earth, right? There's an explosion. All right, let's measure how hefty this explosion is. Uh, there's a pressure wave. There's a sudden increase in temperature. Oh, I add all that stuff up. Oh, 100 energy, still there. All right, so it's the idea is that you pick a time and whatever the energy is, it's that at every time. You just have to find where it went. Okay. Doesn't some of the energy though, get dissipated into the atmosphere and other things like energy loss as it's moving? Well, yeah, that's a good question. And if it's there, it's still there. So it's, it's maybe more dispersed and it's not available to the meteor for speeding up anymore. It's in the air and it's heated the air up and you can't get that back now, right? That's gone energy for the purposes of using it to do something, but it is still there. So, so we could still uh, say that the energy never... exists even after it has left the object. Got it. Yeah, that's a great question. So maybe let me let me put it in terms of something like this. Um, when my son was really young, he liked building blocks. So I got him a dozen building blocks, you know, just, just stacking stuff up. They got letters on some of them and all this type of thing, right? <clears throat> uh, but he and I played this game of hiding them. So I said, okay, hey, happy birthday or happy whatever. You know, like, hey, here you go. Got you these wooden blocks. And he's like, wow, cool. He's playing with them. And I leave the room. And then I come back later and there's only four. I'm looking around the room. I was like four blocks. Well, my mind is telling me what happened to the other eight blocks. Well, they didn't just disappear, did they? My mind is saying, well, they're here somewhere. Blocks don't just up and disappear. Huh? Energy, same thing, doesn't just up and disappear. I have to find out where the blocks went. So, okay, here's, oh, yep, there's one in the toy chest. Okay, found that one. Oh, two under the carpet. Here we go, two of them. Okay, that's good. I found three of them. Boy, I can't find any more of them. Where'd they go? 
all right, I gotta, I gotta expand my, my, my view. I gotta find out where they went because I've only found some of them. Same things happening with energy here. And, and that point you brought up about it being dispersed in the atmosphere, great point, because you have to go search for that. That's not something you can easily find sometimes, right? And so I go outside. Oh, he threw a couple out the window. Here we go. I found them. There they are. I got them. Okay. Um, now I've got two more. So I had, I don't know, I got to search for three more, say. Okay. Well, now it's a little tougher because now I'm going to look. There's this um, like lockable box that he has. Okay. Well, I'm going to say, well, is there one in here? I'm going to go take a look. And he starts screaming. No, you can't look in there. Don't look in there. You're not allowed to look in there. Like, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Can I weigh it? Okay. You can weigh it. All right. Thanks. So I take the weight of the, of this toy chest, right. Or, or this lockable box that he has. And I weigh it and I go back and I look, I, I remember the weight of it when it was, uh, when it was new and I gave it to him. Oh, there's, there's a difference in the weight here. Now I can't see the block but I have to infer that it's in there because if I subtract these weights, it's equal to the weight of one block. Ah, all right. So this time I'm just going to say, all right, I know there's a block in there, but I'm not going to try and visually see it, but I know there's one in there. And he threw two in here. There's his glass of, his glass of water here or milk. Can't see, right? But the level is higher. How much is the level higher by? Oh, it's as if you put two blocks into there because it, it pushed the level of the milk up a little bit. Okay, so I can't see them, but I know they're in there. Okay, and the same is true with energy. You got to search around. The energy's there. Where is it? What's it doing? Is it in height? Is it in mov moving faster? Is it in temperature of the atmosphere is suddenly greater? Is it in, uh, right? Something like this. Where, where is it, right? You take your hand. I just put a whole lot of energy into doing that. Oh. Yeah, I can feel that now. My hands are warmer. Okay. So where did the energy go? Um, you track it down. That's kind of how <clears throat> that's kind of how you can think about energy. So the energy is always there and it doesn't change. And it and it doesn't matter how big of a system you choose. And that's the other part that's really interesting about this. It doesn't matter how big the system is. All right. So you choose, for example, you know the bowling ball and the, and the earth and the air and stuff like this. And you say, okay, the bowling ball is going up and down. And the reason that it has energy is because earth is pulling on it. And you store energy like that and it can come down and do this. Okay. But you can also take earth as an entire, um, as an entire system and think about is energy conserved inside earth? Okay. Well, we grow food. We eat the food. So the food has energy. We eat it. That gives us energy to, to do whatever it is we do all day. And we push bowling ball around, right? So we give, we take some of the food energy and we throw the bowling ball. Now the bowling ball has taken some of our energy and it's gone into moving the bowling ball. Okay. Or, and right, we do stuff like this. Um, Earth itself, though, does have energy coming in and it does have energy going out. So um, the, uh, the balance is, uh, is, a little bit, is a little bit off right now. Um, reason being that we burn fossil fuels. And when you burn something, there's excess heat that you need to dump. And it goes into the atmosphere. And this has been heating our atmosphere for the last about 150 years. It's not big, small amounts, but it's been 150 years. So now it's a rather larger amount. Okay. And uh, what's been happening now is uh, our input energy from the sun. Okay. Sun's providing energy in here. We get it. We warm up. The plants take it and do photosynthesis make their sugars and plant proteins and whatever plants do because the the shirt says physics not biology so they do that and then we eat it or a or an animal eats it and then you eat the animal all right however you do stuff right ultimately something had to have taken the energy that's coming in made it into something usable we eat it we get energy 
uh, we put the energy into other things, right? <clears throat> um, Earth also is hot. And what I mean by that is it's hotter than outer space. So anything that is hotter than its surroundings gives off heat, not like hot air though, in like, in like um, infrared, okay? It's like the heat radiation. You can, uh, you can feel it, not when you put your hand above a candle, but when you put it to the side of the candle, that's when you'd feel the, the heat radiation. So Earth is radiating off some heat. What we've been finding in the last about 100-ish years or so is that our amount of heat um, that's leaving has slightly decreased. We're trapping it more. And that's what these greenhouse gases are doing. We'll talk more about that. Uh, I don't know, next week or the week after. Pretty soon, though, we'll talk about climate. Um, and so our energy balance is slightly off because sun goes through cycles. Sometimes it puts out more energy. Sometimes it puts out less energy. It does these things. It's not a constant thing. Nothing is. But what we are noticing is that um, we are unable to dump as much heat as we were doing. So that means that we are slowly overall experiencing a rise in temperature. <clears throat> okay. So energy is this huge concept that, that extends through loads and loads and loads of situations. And it's ultimately... This law right here <clears throat> is probably the biggest science uh, law that we have. This one, this one, everybody uses this one, and you see why because it's so pervasive. Everybody uses it because it's because it's in everything. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, good. So, and I was going to show you this car, the pullback car, too. Um, I can't, I can't see what the mechanism is here, but if I let the wheels go, oh, if the wheels go, nothing happens because my car's broken. Sorry. Dang it. Well, point is here, when you pull one of these cars back and you hold it, then let it go. You say, wow, this thing's picking up, it, you know, it's moving faster. How's it doing that? Where's that? Where's this motion energy coming from? And you have to start doing the same types of deductions that we did with the, with the building blocks. And you have to say, well, wh what's a way that energy can get stored in something like this? How do, we, how do we know that there's energy in here? Well, if you let it go, it starts moving. That means it must have had some in there and it's using it up somehow, right? Just like we do a whole bunch of stuff all during the day. And then we go, man, I'm really hungry. I got to eat something, right? And you eat something. And about, you know, half hour later, you're like, let's go, right? Because I feel so much energy. Yeah, right? Or you drink one of those energy drinks, which is uh, mostly sugar and caffeine. And it gets you, and then all of a sudden, right? You, you got to have another one because it only lasts for so long. Um, right. Same thing in things like this, right? Whoops. Can't see that slinky, right? There's, there's, there's energy that I can, I can have in the slinky, right? Or springs, right? I can take the energy. I can have the energy in the spring and I can go, yep, watch this. And I let it go and it comes back to itself. So the energy, <clears throat> um, is always there and we have to find out what form it's taking, where is it stored, what's going on. That's the fun part, and that's energy for it. All right, so that's this. Uh, any questions at this point, <clears throat> which you may have? All righty. Uh, here, I'm going to do a share screen. Okay. Here is. Okay, here it is. Found it. 
So here's my chart on energy. So this is a, a chart of energy in an object per, I said per gram, but you can say it's basically like per pound or per weight or something like that. So if you have a whole lot more of this object, you'll the, the energy will scale up um, as I as I calculate here. Um, so you can start with the very first one that says water, which is dammed at 100 meters. So a river flows, we stick a big dam in front of it. And then what do we do? We let it fall right down through a waterfall. <clears throat> and as it's falling, we stick a fan in the way. The water hits the fan blades, turns the fan, and through things that we'll talk about in a couple of weeks, maybe like five, six weeks, electricity gets made. And you can make electricity from hydroelectric dams. Yeah, so that's, okay, so how much energy do we get from that? Well, you can see we get about one, what's called a joule. I'll tell you real quick about uh, energy units. You have the calorie, which you're probably well aware of. You eat 2,000 of these things every day. And then in, um, in calories, there's about, uh, there's about uh, 4,000 calories in a joule. So that's why the number of joules is one. And then the number of calories is about one four thousandth of that. So, um, and on the last column here, I have compare it to TNT. So you can go down and look at TNT, which is a high explosive. It has about one calorie per gram, and uh, that means you could uh, you could get a calories worth of energy out of this thing, right? You could eat that; it would not do you very good, but it would you right, and then that would supply your energy because your body has to then break it down, and uh, that's how you get your energy. <clears throat> okay, so there's a couple of more things in here. You can see some batteries. I've calculated how much energy is in batteries: um, three or four percent, as much as is in TNT. Uh, TNT, which is just dynamite. Uh, here's a bullet traveling at two and a half times the speed of sound. That's about 10% of TNT. Uh, oh, rechargeable laptop batteries, not bad. And I will say they are getting better. Laptop batteries and rechargeable batteries in general, this is a huge industry. And um, the amount of increase of electric vehicles with large ranges of mileage that we've seen in the last, say, decade, it's due to the battery industry making better batteries, not the not the just the um, not the alkaline cells or the or the lead acid cells that you have, like a lead acid battery for your car or the alkaline types. Those are just throwaways. So they end up in trash, leaching into the chemicals back into Earth. I'm talking the rechargeables are getting really good. They're they're constantly on the improvement. Um, now here you go past TNT now. Take a look. There's some surprising things in this table, right? Look at this. Chocolate chip cookies has five times the amount of energy per weight that TNT has. Really? How is that possible? Well, look down a few, and then there's butter. Butter has nine times the amount of energy per gram of TNT or per weight. That's astounding. <clears throat> what that means is it's more efficient to get a dozen chips ahoy and feed them to some football players with sledgehammers and say, go break that building up than it is to do it with dynamite. More efficient, right? Much less expensive. You don't have to worry about having, you know, all the permits. You just give sledgehammers to, to football players and say, here, eat a couple of chocolate chip cookies. Yeah, that's good stuff, right? Uh, the kicker, gasoline. Oh, I skipped over coal. Coal's in there. We have lots of coal. We, United States, uh, we have the greatest coal reserves of any country in the world, and um, and we burn it. And gasoline. There's some more gas. So we don't have reserves of gasoline so much, but or I should say, you know, oil. Um, but we uh, import lots and lots of gasoline. Why? because it's 11 times better in terms of explosive ability than dynamite. So it's got a huge bang and it's a fluid, which means we can pump it and move it around easily. I mean, what's not to love about gasoline? Essentially, 
it's in the burning of it that we eventually run into problems. And it's really not even that, it's the amount that we use that's the problem. Um, we got natural gas, we've got hydrogen. Maybe we'll talk about hydrogen next time. Um, and then we get into, look at that, asteroid or meteor moving about 20 miles per second has do to do a hundred times, 107 times TNT. Is that any wonder it exploded? Any wonder it exploded when that meteor hit Earth? Eh, yeah, mm -hmm, that's why, 100 times TNT. So nice, right? Um, after that, we get into some rather um, esoteric things, nuclear fission and fusion, and then positron annihilation. Um, and those numbers, I will say this, we're, we're going to talk about nuclear processes more towards the end of the class. But I will say this. When scientists first started looking at what energy is released during a nuclear process, they ran onto that number. You know what they thought? And this would have been the 19, like middle 1930s, eh, early 1930s, the early 1930s, right? We had light bulbs, we had cars, we had mm, batteries, we had batteries, um, we had electricity, right? We had all this type of thing. We had a kind of an increasing amount of energy using things. When they saw that number 20 million times as much as dynamite, you know what they thought? Our energy problems are over. It's done. All we got to do is that. And we have as much as we want, the, way more than we could ever use. Well, here we are about 90 years later. Still working. Still working, yeah. So um, there's that. Now the next page of this, I'll go into this a little bit more next time, but growing world energy needs. This is a little bit, uh, I have not updated this recently. I was just looking at the other website where I got this from, but I did this in uh, about 05 or 06, I think. And it was for uh, until year of 02. So it's a little bit late. Um, but it's looking at how much energy does a country use per person, per capita, uh, versus how much money each person makes, right? So not surprisingly, here's the United States, way up here, lots of energy per person, lots of money per person compared to the rest of the world, okay? France, UK, you know, a lot of Western Europe in here, Ireland, Japan, right in there. So they're all kind of on about the same level, right about the same type of thing. Russia is a very interesting case. They were not going up, they were going down. That was just after the, not at, not just, but it was about a decade after communism uh, was, uh, I don't know, defeated, I'm not sure how you say that, but they were on the way down. Everyone else is on the way up towards the upper right of this graph. Um, and here in the circle, I've got China and India and a little bit of Brazil. And this is 40% of the world's population are in these regions. And they have the fastest increases in energy needs and consumption. Okay. <clears throat> um, we will talk more about that in the next uh, class. But for now, the, and that's what I mean. Energy is so pervasive. You vote on it, right? Because people need energy. And they need to... Uh, they um, need to use it in order to have the ability to use things and have a good life, right? So, um, so there's that. Uh, yeah, I think um, with that, um, I will, uh, Gosh, I wanted to do one other thing. What was it? I wanted to show you one other thing. Um, hmm. Oh, I remember what it was. I remember. I remember. Let's see if I got it real quick here. Uh, darn, I was looking at it just before class too. That's a bummer. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about it and then I'll show it to you next class. Um, because of that meteor um, example that, that I showed you with the truck, herein lies the reason we lost the dinosaurs. And it really is, there was a meteor that hit Earth 
just in the Yucatan Peninsula, right? Just kind of, you go, it's south of Mexico, it's kind of up, there's this little hook right up in here in the Yucatan, and there's a huge depression. There's a massive hole in Earth right there that nobody can see because now it's covered with water, right? The ocean has come in, but it's there. And what has happened is people have done soil samples of that region, and they've done soil samples of other regions around the world at that level. Um, what was it? Uh, 60, 80 million years ago. And when you do that, when you go down in Earth, right, because that's how you go back in time on Earth, you go down. Um, when you reach that, that level, you find the soil is the same, which means that dust got kicked up into the atmosphere, covered the globe, settled, stayed there, and then everything else happened on top of that. But you find that everywhere which means that this was a worldwide cataclysmic event. And that was the shadowing of the sun, the reducing of the incoming energy, and therefore the loss of 90% of the world's population of animals and plants because the plants died. And as soon as the plants die, everything else does. So uh, there you go. That's the sum total of what I was trying to show you with a couple of pictures. So with that, I will say... Happy weekend. I hope you have a good four day weekend. Um, uh, well, at least from Cabrillo, not, not everybody's doing a Friday, Monday issue here. I'm not really sure how we got to do that. But um, I will see you on Tuesday. Remember that it won't be a live class. It will be asynchronous posted on Canvas. And um, don't forget about homework two. Get homework two and quiz two done before the days end. Any issues, fire me an, e fire me an email. Happy rest of your day, folks. Have a good weekend. I'll see you Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you.